this is Q&A at 150 words per minute. I will be the question. I will be the answer. Ready? Dr. Masker, will you agree with me that Exhibit 6 is the third supplement to your expert report and that it was issued June 5th, 2001? It appears to be, yes. And in this document, you describe some groundwater sampling that you performed after drilling a groundwater monitoring well on Dr. Hamilton's property, correct? Say it again, please. Sampling after drilling. After drilling, installing a groundwater monitoring well. Yes. The document seems to indicate that you and others installed the well in late April and early May. Is that accurate? Yes. Up to that time, you had not done any groundwater sampling on Dr. Hamilton's property, correct? I had not done any groundwater sampling on Dr. Hamilton's property prior to that. That's correct. I am sorry. I was reading. Why did you decide to do a groundwater study on Dr. Hamilton's property? I wouldn't characterize it as a study. It is a single well. I would like to have more wells. There are always constraints. Several things led to it. Let's see if we can formulate it. In looking at the drilling logs where there are good drilling logs for the site, I found that wells were screened into different levels, 65 and 75 feet generally, although I don't think there is shallow and deep groundwater. I think it is all interconnected. And what does that show? The groundwater at the surface was, there is no evidence that groundwater at the surface was sampled. 65 feet is very far down into the aquifer, so anything that was lightweight would float, would be missed by placing the wells at 65 feet. Placing wells in this situation, because you could allow these hydrochlorinated hydrocarbons passage to deep levels, it appears some of that happened in looking at the data, where over 70 parts per million PCBs and other materials were found below 160 feet or in a 160-foot deep well. Okay. Also, the well log showed that repeatedly in almost every well, there is a good record of fissures, cracks, voids, some of them occupied by moving water some occupied by clays, some stated as giving off strong odor, these fissures, cracks, caves. Voids were present in almost every well where there was good records, particularly the deep ones, ones that were below 30, from 30 feet on down, you were finding these. So you find them in some of the shallow ones, but certainly in the deep wells. It is well known that water moving in that kind of situation can go hundreds to thousands of meters per day so that the potential to transport PCBs, clays with PCBs attached, solvents or anything that is either dissolved or moving in suspended stage, the potential to do that appeared to be quite large. Lieberman and Carmichael pointed out the car stick nature. They pointed out the fact that there are fractures in the area, major fracture traces. They pointed out that many of the wells appeared to be in some way interconnected. Several of the wells and that, un that groundwater movement in the wells in the area tested by the wells on site could be more than 100 feet a day, which corresponds to the type of movement you get in car stick terrains. Just so the record is clear, why don't you define karst for us? Solutional cavities in certain carbonate rocks, such as limestones and dolomites. What we typically think of as caves are karstic. The area directly above karst area is often the area in which many things may move because of drying and wetting. And the situation under miles, the limestone surface, where the surface is, Limestone is rugose, that is, it is rough. That allows for pooling of materials such as DNA PLs until they find a channel downward and continue downwards up to cracks, fissures, voids, caves. So there was the potential that what Miles put in landfill A would go into a fracture or perhaps fault, could have found its way down readily into groundwater and been pursed in particulate form by suspension or by dissolution in the water. 
Is there data to back up what you're saying? There is no data available that I have seen looking at these cracks as fissures as they were encountered by Miles in drilling, even though some of them were. This is a 150 word per minute jury charge. Ready? The decision herein passes only on the integrity of a criminal trial in the federal courts. It does not determine the guilt or innocence of the petitioners, and we do not reach other issues propounded in the lengthy briefs or which may be present in the trial record of 4,147 pages. The Solicitor General of the United States moved to remand the case to the trial court for further proceedings because of untruthful testimony given before other tribunals by Joseph D. Maloney, a government witness in this case. The counter motion of petitioners asked for a new trial. The decision is based entirely upon the representations of the government in its written motion and on the statements of the Solicitor General during the argument on the motions. The petitioners were charged in a one-count indictment in the district court with conspiracy to violate the Smith Act. They were convicted, and the Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, sitting on bunk, affirmed by a divided court. This court granted the petition for writ of certiorari, and the case was scheduled for argument on October 10, 1998. On September 27, 1998, the Solicitor General of the United States filed a motion calling the attention of the court to the testimony given in other proceedings by Maloney, who was one of the seven witnesses for the government in this case. On the argument of the motion, the Solicitor General, in response to questions by the court, stated with commendable candor that he believed the testimony given by Maloney on June 18, 1995, before the Senate Committee was untrue. He likewise stated that he believed the testimony given by Maloney on July 2, 1998, in the Circuit Court of Florida was untrue. In addition to the Solicitor General's personal opinion, the text of the motion itself shows that the Department of Justice is certain that some of Maloney's post-trial testimony was contrary to the facts. In the Florida testimony, he said that the FBI sometimes paid him $1,000 a month for expenses, whereas the records of the Bureau showed he was paid a total of $172.05 as expense money. He also testified there that the FBI arranged to put him in the Army to spy on an officer, whereas the FBI had nothing to do with his Army service. He had been inducted in accordance with the Selective Service Act. All these discrepancies are pointed out in the motion as quoted above. As to his bizarre testimony in the Florida proceeding concerning sabotage, espionage, handling of arms and ammunition, and plots to assassinate senators, congressmen, and a state judge, the government's motion suggests that none of it is worthy of belief, nor is it corroborated by information in the possession of the government. At the oral argument, however, the Solicitor General stated that although he believed all of this testimony to be untrue, he was not prepared to say the witness, Maloney, was guilty of perjury in giving the testimony, that his untrue statements might have been caused by a psychiatric condition, and that such condition might have arisen subsequent to the time of this trial. The Solicitor General, in the light of this position, asked to have the argument on the main case stricken from the calendar and the case remanded to the district court for a full consideration of the credibility of the testimony. Commendable as the action of the Solicitor General was in promptly bringing the matter to our attention when it came to the attention of his office, 
we do not believe the